just a second. Text for sermon for this hour is 1 Timothy chapter 3, primarily verse number 16, as we talk about uh, mystery at this particular hour. Adam has read for us our text. And let's begin our thoughts by just thinking about what a mystery is. Mystery is something that is puzzling, something that is unknown. You think of mysteries, you may think of Sherlock Holmes, you may think of Edgar Allan Poe or some writer or work like that. It's not that a mystery cannot be solved necessarily, but it hasn't been solved yet, or it hasn't been solved by us. And we're a bit perplexed about it until we find out the solution, and we may realize it was right before our eyes all along. We're sort of foolish at how easy, easy it was to solve. And so a mystery, something puzzling, not that it can't be found out, but we haven't found it out yet. You may have heard the story about a man named Juan. Juan came up to the Mexican border on his bicycle. He had two bags over his shoulders, and the guard stopped him and said, What's in the bags? And he said, Sand. And the guard said, I'll bet. Get off your bicycle and let's see what's in the bags. And the guard ripped the bags open, poured it down on the ground. It was sand. And he said, I'm going to detain you tonight. I'm going to send this sand off to a lab and have it analyzed. And he did that. The next day, come to find out, all Juan had in the sacks was sand. And so he sent him on his way. The next week, Juan rode up on his bicycle again with two sacks over his shoulders. And the guard said, what's in the sacks? He said, sand. Guard ripped the bags open again, poured it out of the ground. All it was was sand. And so Juan went on his way. And this process continued for three years. Coming to the border every, every week, two bags of sand and taking that sand into Mexico. Finally, one day Juan didn't show up and the guard met him in a restaurant in Mexico and, and started talking to him. He said, Juan, I know that you're smuggling something across the border and for the life of me, I don't know what it is. It's been driving me crazy. I've been up all night, can't sleep, trying to figure out what it is that you're bringing across the border. And Juan looked at the guard and said, uh, bicycles. I've been smuggling bicycles. <laughs> right before the guard all that time, it really wasn't a mystery if he'd used his head to think about it, but uh, the bags were a decoy, I guess you might say. Not all mysteries are quite that easy to solve. There was a TV program on unsolved mysteries, and it dealt mainly with crimes that uh, had not yet been solved. Some riddles may never be solved in our lifetime, but... We think about our text, 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes of a mystery. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, priests of the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Here was a mystery that is no longer a mystery. It has been solved for us, and Paul gives us the answer. The mystery of God, it is, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. And he's no longer a mystery to our world. At one time, this was a mystery to the prophets of the Old Testament. They predicted the coming of the Messiah, but all they had was just that, predictions. Jesus came and proclaimed that he was the Son of God. He was met with skepticism, unbelief, even from his own family. John chapter 7, verse number 5. To them, Jesus was an enigma. He was a puzzle they couldn't quite figure out. But now we live this out of all that. We have a Bible. It is completed. And we can look back and we see Jesus fulfilling every one of those prophecies. And they looked God in the eye and really did not realize they were looking God in the eye at the time. We have the benefit of hindsight and they did not. Much of the world has heard about Jesus today because of TV, satellite, the internet, and the like. But the world needs to hear the complete truth about the Lord, not just a few facts here and there. He is the way, the truth, and the life. For generations, it was a mystery, a puzzle, how God 
would save the world. It would not be through the blood of bulls and goats, but how would he save the world? It was a mystery how God would unite Jew and Gentile into one body. As they often stood toe to toe, staring in hatred at one another, how could God ever bring these two groups together in one, in peace, in harmony? It was a mystery for generations of what God was and what God is like, but Paul says that mystery is now over. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the mystery revealed, and he outlines that for us in our text, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. You might say that this one verse sort of sums up the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3 is another, but this is a great one too. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. You have here the gospel in a nutshell. So a mystery no more, because number one, God appeared in a body. God appeared in a body. God was manifest or revealed in the flesh. But again, there were prophets who predicted this. Prophets like Isaiah. This was a mystery to prophets like Isaiah. Now, he did not doubt the prophecy that he gave. Isaiah 53, the crucifixion of the Messiah for Isaiah 7, 14. The Messiah coming by being born of a virgin. His name being called Emmanuel. Isaiah did not doubt the truthfulness of that. But it was a mystery to him as to how God would accomplish that. Of course, it's not a mystery to us today because, again, we have the benefit of looking back and seeing Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 2 and other accounts of the birth of our Lord. And so, true to prediction, God came to this earth in a human body, beginning as a baby who grew into a man. As a man, the Bible says, Jesus was tempted in every way we are tempted. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, yet he never sinned. He was tempted to sin just like we're tempted to sin because he was in the flesh just like we are in the flesh. God in the flesh. And that again boggles the mind. God coming to seek and God coming to save the lost. Not to be served but to serve. Again, a mind-boggling concept that God, the creator of all, the august one, came to be a servant to man, to save man. Jesus came to reveal what God is like to us. In this case, it's like father, like son, in every, in every respect. And so, Jesus, coming in the flesh, being tempted as we are, living as a man among men, all of this enabled Christ to be sympathetic to us and toward us. He knows what we're going through. He can identify with the human plight, he being a human himself for a brief period of time. And so he's been there and done that, and he can empathize and sympathize with us. A mystery no more because God appeared in a body. Second, he was justified by the Spirit God was manifest in the flesh first, and second, justified or vindicated by the Spirit. The Spirit, of course, being the Holy Spirit of God. This tells us that Jesus was proved that He was who He claimed to be by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowered Him and gave Him the ability to perform supernatural acts called signs and wonders and miracles in the, body, in, in the Bible, these proved the deity of Jesus. I mean, messiahs in that day were a dime a dozen. You could find a messiah on every corner claiming to be the messiah. There needed to be something to distinguish the true one from all these fakes and phonies. That distinction was made by the Spirit's power. Jesus was empowered by the Spirit at his baptism. I know there are those in the religious world who say that Jesus performed miracles as a boy. He brought back to life a dead bird, and he set a dog's bone that was broken and made it completely whole. But the Bible gives no record of that. Again, the Spirit did not come on Christ until then his baptism. But the point is, 
The Holy Spirit proved Jesus to be the Son of God, not to him, not to God, but to the world. The Holy Spirit proved to the world that Jesus was the Son of God. People could not doubt we are seeing God at work. Even unbelievers had to admit this man is performing miracles, and that we cannot deny. They denied eventually the evidence to the detriment of their own soul. The ultimate miracle was Jesus conquering death. That is, three days later, he was resurrected from the, the uh, grave, and he will, by the power of God, enable us to do likewise. All mankind shall hear his voice and come forth, John chapter 5. And so, what about us? Is the Spirit working in our lives? And we don't want to imply that we can perform the miraculous. We, we cannot. The age of miracles ended when the completed revelation was given. But does the Holy Spirit prove us to be the child of God? That is, do we follow His Word? Do we use His sword? Are we incorporating into our lives the wonderful fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5, the things we've studied before, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, patience, and the like. If we are, if we're living by Scripture, then in essence the Spirit is proving us to be children of God simply because we're following His Word and the, the dictates of God. Again, as people look at our lives, they should see the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, transforming us more and more into the image of Christ. Being faithful, yes, on the Lord's day, but it's easy to be faithful on the Lord's day. Easy to be proved by the Spirit to be children of God on the Lord's day. But what about on Monday? What about at work, on the job? What about our demeanor there? What about at school? What about our spirit there? What about when we're in the world? It's easy for the Spirit to prove that we're children of God in here, but what about when we're out there in the workaday world, in the evil world? What do people see in us in the world? There was an elder in a congregation, not in this state, and of course you would expect an elder to be faithful at church, to be present at every assembly. And from that standpoint, he was a great elder for the church. But his sons played ball. And when that elder was at the ballpark, you could not tell he was an elder of the church. You couldn't tell he was a Christian by the words he used and the yelling and the anger that he exhibited before others. It was embarrassing to his family. It was embarrassing to the church, not to mention God above. You see, the Spirit could not prove he was a child of God in the world because he was not acting like a child of God. People ought to tell who we are because of the influence of the Holy Spirit's teaching in our lives as we follow the Word. Mystery no more. God was manifest in the flesh, justified by the Spirit. Third, He was seen by angels. Verse again, 16. And again, Jesus was seen by angels. In fact, He left the multitude of angelic beings in heaven to come to this earth. But here we speak of His being seen by angels on the earth. The angels saw Jesus at His birth. The angels came to Jesus, the Bible says, after his temptation. The angels came and ministered to him, Matthew 4, verse 11. And no doubt this happened perhaps many other times. It's not recorded for us in Scripture. Revealing that Jesus was a human. That is, he was God in the flesh. He had a body just like ours that does get tired, that does need nourishment, that does need encouraging at times. He needed help just as we need help. He needed to be ministered to just as we do. And so the angels came and they saw the Lord and they helped the Lord. The Bible says that angels came to Peter. We'll study that in Acts 12. And they helped Peter get out of jail. The Bible says that an angel came to Philip and told him to go south and preached to one man, the Ethiopian eunuch. And what about today, of course, is the big question mark. No question that angels were involved in Jesus' life while on earth, Peter's life while on earth, Philip's life while on earth. What about those who minister to us today? 
Well, certainly if we're married, we have a mate who cares for us. We have friends, obviously, who care for us. Can it be in a providential way that angels still care for the people of God? Again, in a non-miraculous way, are they assisting? Well, I don't, I don't know that, but I do know this. The writer of Hebrews said that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to those who will inherit salvation. Hebrews 4, or 1 rather, verse 14. And so whatever angels may or may not do today, let them do what they do or don't do because we're not powerless to stop them anyway. We appreciate all the help, providential help we can get to make it to heaven. But we know for a fact that angels came and ministered unto the Lord. Mystery no more. Mystery no more because Jesus was preached among the Gentiles. Manifest of the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen by angels and preached among the Gentiles. And he's still being preached among the Gentiles and Jews and anyone who will listen today. Paul's marching orders are our marching orders today to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Timothy chapter four. We believe in the preaching of the word and the preaching about Jesus. It is God's ordained way for some people to be reached for Christ. We want to stick to that. We want to preach the Word. We want to point people to the Word. That's the only way people can be saved. And so the importance of evangelism by preaching, but also and with equal weight, the importance of evangelism by living. Preach the Word, but also live the Word. Preaching from a pulpit is not the only way to win people to Jesus. In fact, it may be the least effective way because the lost are not here with us. The lost are out there. And so how necessary it is for us then to live the gospel before others. When we do that, we then are in position to strike up a conversation with a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker about Christ. The church was established, and we read in Acts, we'll get to the Acts chapter 8, that it was actually primarily the church members, not the apostles, who were responsible of leaving and taking the gospel to the lost. Acts 8, 4 says the church was scattered, and whenever we're preaching the word, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but the church was scattered, and they took the gospel with them where they were scattered. They preached the gospel and they lived the gospel. The mystery of godliness is a mystery no more because Jesus was preached among the Gentiles. It is to this day. Mystery no more because Jesus was believed on in the world, manifest in the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. Now, does this mean that everybody in Jesus' day believed in Him? It does not. Did the majority of people in Jesus' day believe in Him? No, they did not. But those who had good and honest hearts did believe, they did obey, and thus began the church of Jesus Christ. Again, we looked at that in Acts the second chapter. They did what they could with what they had, and they passed their faith on to others. They knew that faith in the Lord is something too good to keep to yourselves. Today, the people of our world need to believe on or in the Lord, but so many do not. As I guess has always been true, we're facing a mass rejection of faith in Christ. We're told that we live in a world that is too sophisticated for faith. We need something that you can duplicate in a laboratory, in science, in chemistry. We're taught that seeing is believing. Unless I see, I won't believe, and therefore no need for faith. The, a a the ranks of atheists are swelling, and people are rejecting their only hope of salvation, the only Savior there is. And like all of us, they too one day will die. And if they die in that condition, they die with no shred of hope. Not a shred of hope at all. 
For that reason, we thank God for the patient nation, nature that he has. Peter speaks of the long-suffering nature of God. Second Peter chapter 3, in verse 9, Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes we wonder, as, as evil as our world has gotten, why hasn't God come back already and destroyed the wickedness in this world? And the answer, no doubt, lies in the fact that he's waiting for people to come around, waiting day by day in hopes that somebody else will become a Christian, that somebody else will be pulled from the fires of hell. Thank God for his patient nature. But as we know, his patience one day will be up. And until then, we want to be doing our utmost to help people believe on the Lord, people who are in the world. The mystery of Godliness is a mystery no more because Jesus was believed on in the world. And then finally, the mystery of Godliness is a mystery no more because Jesus was taken up into glory, manifested the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then received up into glory. We know, of course, that that phrase is a reference to the ascension. Not long ago, we studied that in Acts, the first chapter. The disciples were Jesus on the mountain. He was giving them some, I guess what we would call last minute instructions. And his goodbye was to be lifted from this earth. And literally, they saw him go up into heaven and vanished in the clouds. And their jaws must have hit the earth when they saw that. And uh, they went back happy. And glad because Jesus had fulfilled the prediction that, of course, he had made. What a sight that must have been, his being received up into glory. And as great a sight as that was for those men to see, we can't fathom what it was in heaven for Christ to come back to heaven where he left and then to be enthroned at the right hand of the throne of God, reigning as king over his kingdom as head over his church, you can just imagine the angelic celebration that occurred at the ascension and coronation of Christ in heaven itself. Jesus had to leave the scene in order to finish his Father's work. Jesus did finish his Father's work. As he died on the cross, some of his last words, It is finished. Jesus finished the work that God gave him to do. And now it is simply up to us to carry on his work. We need to walk in his steps. We need to do his work. And God has left us neither alone nor helpless. We have his spirit today through the word to tell us what to do, how to live, how to worship, how to please God. We have the assurance that God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We're never alone, as, as we did sing a few moments ago. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go, because He is always with us. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. I'm afraid some sing that song as if, anywhere, anywhere, fear is all I know. That's not how the song goes. That's not how it ought to be for the child of God. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We'll not be stranded here with no way out. He's given us the promise. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. 1 John 4 in verse 4. And as he told Timothy, he tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Friends, if we will continue living for Christ in the life that we've been given, then someday we also will be lifted up into heaven, all because of Jesus, and we will bask forever in the glory of the light of the Lamb of God. That is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16, which to us is a mystery no more. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the answer. Some mysteries may never be solved this side of eternity, there's a program on TV called Cold Case Files. I like to watch those sometimes. And of course, those are cold cases of crimes that had not been solved, but 
were sort of resurfaced and eventually they were solved, but there are tons of cold case files that odds are will never be solved in this life. Some mysteries might not be solved, but the mystery of godliness, there's no doubt about that. The solution again is Jesus, the life, death, and ongoing work of Jesus in converting the lost. And so some mysteries may never be solved, but how God would save the lost is no longer a mystery. The plan is plain. Putting my faith in Jesus, no doubt, whatever, He's the Son of God. Repenting of sins in my life, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I acknowledge I am a sinner. I want to do better. Confessing Christ as Lord before men and being baptized in water that my sins might be washed away. We may not understand the exact how of forgiveness, but again, the mystery is plain, revealed. Baptism washes our sins away, Acts 22, 16. And then my responsibility is to be a faithful child of God. And I stumble. We all do. We're all sinners this side of conversion. Then no need for baptizing, being baptized again and again. Simply the need for confessing that fault, repenting of it, people praying that we might be forgiven. Thank God that God sent His Son to die for mankind. Thank God for the plan of salvation. Thank God for His Word, which by we live, we live by, we can't have a home in heaven. Respond this morning if you need to as we stand.